I was there all the time, but only now uh, we, we can meet. So because now we are thinking that we can get people from anywhere we want. Uh, so it, it is becoming uh, and uh, it is becoming uh, very, very easy to get people from everywhere and uh, get them to uh, uh, talk. So um, what I will do, uh, uh, I, I think uh, Norman might have talked to you. Um, uh, uh, let me, I will start with a very brief introduction of my background so that you have an idea of who I am uh, and, uh, um, and you will see that uh, I, I am actually uh, similar, my background is very similar to most of you. Um, and then uh, I will talk a bit about maybe 20 minutes or so, I will talk about what is case study teaching. Um, and then we will do one case study uh, just to get up, uh, which uh, Numan um, uh, 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 has already shared with you. Um, and then after that, uh, so that will be the plan for today. And next week, I will go through how to prepare. I will give you a bit of a uh, hint today, but how to prepare for a case study teaching that I, I, and what are the preparation, how to teach, how to evaluate all these things we'll do the next but in order to give you an idea about how to teach i want to i wanted to do this uh, particular case study today so i will first share um, uh, my slides just one minute here. everyone can see this one yes yes yes, yes. Okay. yes. Uh, um so uh, uh, if you have any question, please, uh, 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 I know uh, if you have any questions, there are two things. Uh, otherwise, it, there will be no, um, uh, no learning. Uh, please stop me. There are two ways. Either you can stop me and ask, uh, you can unmute and ask me uh, 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 a question. Or if you uh, feel uh, uncomfortable, you can also type in the chat. I can uh, look at the chat and if there are a question, you can type on the chat. I will be looking at the chat also. I, I will answer your question. So either you can ask me, unmute and ask me, or you can put it in chat. So uh, I will I will go to the uh, my a bit about myself, just to give you an idea about wh what is my background. Um, I, I am a professor in a business school. Uh, the, we do not call business school, but we call faculty of management. But it's the business school. Uh, we call faculty of management. Desotel is the guy who gave a lot of money. So it's, uh, it's named after him. Uh, Desertal Faculty of Management in McGill University. Uh, we are situated in uh, Montreal, which is uh, in Quebec, which is the more uh, French speaking uh, part of uh, 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 Canada. But I, uh, the McGill is a fully English uh, university. So everything happens in English uh, in McGill. Mm, and as I said to someone just now that I actually cannot speak anything in French, though my daughter is actually fully bilingual. She can speak, uh, uh, speak, write everything uh, French and English equally well. Um, and I, I, am, uh, I am a professor in supply chain management. Uh, we call it operations management. The area is called operations management. Uh, I'm the James McGill chair there. And I also run a, a part of a school called Ben Sadun School of Retail Management. Uh, so anything to do with retail supply chains, pricing, a lot of things uh, 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 that is a part of this school of retail management. I run that school. I have I joined McGill in uh, 2001. Uh, uh, um, but before that, and this is where I, I know Noman, I, my undergraduate is engineering. Uh, uh, in India, uh, I did production engineering, which is somewhat similar to uh, in India, they call production engineering what uh, in other parts of the world you call manufacturing engineering. In India, we call production engineering. So uh, my undergraduate is in production engineering and then I worked for around five, five and a half years. And then in 1996, I joined uh, AIT uh, in industrial systems engineering. And that is where uh, actually I know two of uh, uh, your colleagues, Norman and Arman uh, from there. Uh, and then I, uh, I finished in 97, and then in 98, I came to Canada to do my PhD. Uh, I did it in, it's called Department of Management Science in University of Waterloo. 
uh, but Department of Management Science is actually a part of the Faculty of Engineering. So even my PhD is from Faculty of Engineering. So I joined in 1998 and I finished in 2001. And from 2001, I am in uh, McGill. So all my undergraduate, to, to tell you the thing that all my bachelor, uh, undergraduate, masters and PhD all are in engineering. And uh, until, until I uh, came to McGill, to the business school, I had never taught any case study. So I actually, like you, I also had to learn how to teach a case study. Uh, and even in the, my first term when I came to McGill, I started, uh, uh, I was told to teach a course called Operation Strategy, where I had to teach uh, uh, actually seven case study in the course. Um, and until that, I had hardly done, forget about teaching, I had, I had hardly done any case study. Um, that, that now it is changed in the even uh, in North American engineering schools there are a lot of case studies. But when we were doing, uh, let's say in AIT when I we did, did our masters, uh, there was hardly I don't think in our two years almost there was hardly one case study we did uh, during our two years. So it was not a part of uh, engineering schools at all. Um, so I had to also learn just like the way that you are learning how to teach case studies. And, I, and this is some of the things I will uh, uh, talk about uh, that uh, my feeling about case study. And the good thing is that uh, my background matches with your background. So some of the, I can feel what, what, are, the, uh, what are the strengths. So case study cannot be used everywhere. There are places where case studies are very good. There are places where the case studies are not that good. So I will talk about where the case study should be used and where case study should not be used. Um, as I said, uh, uh, my research interest is in the supply chain area and also risk management, uh, 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 retailing. And I teach a uh, lot of those types of courses. I, uh, I, I, I used to teach a lot in undergrad. Now I don't teach so much in undergrad. I teach mostly uh, a master's student. And master's, I teach MBA, as well as we have specialized master. Um, uh, we have two specialized master. One is on supply chain. Uh, another is on analytics. I teach in both of these programs and I still teach uh, MBA. So, and must our undergraduate program has a bit of case study, uh, uh, but our master's program has a lot of case study. And again, we'll talk about which type of courses there should be more case studies, which type of courses there should be less case studies and so on. Uh, we'll talk about those ones also. Uh, so this is my background. I, I wanted to tell you the background because one is to just to make a connection how I know no one. And the second thing is uh, to give, uh, tell a bit about that. I, I understand where you are coming from. So I, 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 my background matches with your background. So I had to also learn uh, what, uh, uh, how to teach case studies. Um, um, so this is about my background. And then I will uh, talk about what is case study and uh, give you a, a 15 to 20 minutes of uh, introduction. Um, any questions? Any questions? Please feel free. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, I have a question, so, Professor Saibal. Uh, How long it takes you to adjust yourself from engineering? Yeah, I, I, I saw the yeah, I saw the question in the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, for me, it, it takes a bit longer time. But for me, the good thing is, that, as you know, that everything in life, if you, are, if you are pushed to do something, you have to do it. So, um, so as I joined, uh, I joined McGill in August and I was starting to teach in September uh, and it was a course, it was not a normal supply chain or inventory course. The course was called Operation Strategy. And so in the strategy part, there is a bit more application of case study. So they said that it is not only one or two, you have to teach seven or eight case studies, at least in the course. And so I had to learn extremely quickly how to teach case study. But uh, it takes to teach two to three times before you, um, uh, before you get uh, 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 comfortable in teaching case study, two to three times. It's not so much of how long it's, you have to teach. And uh, again, I will talk about it, uh, maybe not today, but next class that, what you should do is that you, when you are developing your course, you will select a case study. Let's say you will select three case studies in a class. And 
the, the students, and again, I will repeat these things next class again. Oh, by the way, Norman, if you want, you can record the, uh, 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 record the presentation, then you can share actually. Yes, already recorded. Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so, um, um, so the thing is that um, uh, 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 when, I, when I teach the students, and you will see when you start teaching students, there are certain cases which are what I would call classic cases, and I will give you some examples next, uh, next time when I teach. There is a classic cases. There is a very famous case from Harvard called Karsten Cookies. Uh, for process analysis, it is still a very, very famous case. But the students don't like those cases. They think that these are old cases. They want to know only about the new things. So, uh, so it's very, so you have to, every year, let's say if I am doing four cases, every year I keep three cases from before and I try one new case. And then next year, again, I keep three cases, I try one new case. So every four years, I am almost changing the whole cases, but I do not change all the cases at one time. I change a bit of, because you have to go on and, but there are two reasons. When you are preparing for a case, you have to spend a bit of effort. Yeah, and this is one of the things we'll talk about. You have to spend a bit of effort in learning about the case, what type of questions. So if you are doing it just one time, it is just not worth it. There is too much of effort spent in uh, learning about the case. And you will learn from the students. There will be some questions. When I am teaching you, the, uh, when we will discuss, not so much uh, teach, when we'll discuss the Amazon case, there are certain questions which will be of interest to you. There are certain questions which I think is of interest, but might not be of interest to you. So these things you will learn the first time you teach. The second time will be better. And second time, third time will be even better. So ideally you want to, uh, once you prepare, you want to teach it for next five, six years, but the problem is that the students don't like it. Uh, so that's the thing basically. Um, uh, uh, okay, so, uh, um, uh, uh, how many, there is another question, how many cases ideally for one subject in MBA program? So hold on that question. When I talk about uh, 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 the different levels, I will talk about how many, uh, uh, I will come to that uh, particular issue that there are certain courses where the number of cases are low. There are certain courses where the number of cases are high. Um, depending on the course, uh, depending on the type of students, undergraduate, we have less uh, cases. Masters, we have more cases within masters. Core courses have less cases. Elective courses have more cases. Within the elective, if you are teaching an inventory management course, there are some cases, but not a lot. But if you teach a more applied course, let's say I am talking about, for example, retail, uh, retail supply chain, then there are more cases when it is a based on, uh, because in an inventory supply, inventory management, you might want to teach EOQ model, news vendor problem, more technical, and there are some cases. But when you are teaching a particular retail, uh, manufacturing based on a particular uh, uh, focus area of industry, you tend to have more cases. So uh, we'll talk about how many cases you should have. Uh, that will depend on the type of students, that will depend on the type of the course and so on. Um, there is another uh, lecturer is required to, no, we do not have any certification for teaching case study. Uh, uh, from time to time, you can go to Harvard um, to take uh, some, uh, uh, but uh, actually uh, next class, again, I will tell you that you can actually open an account in Harvard and Harvard already has a lot of material. You can get it for free about how to teach case studies also. So uh, not a lot, but some videos and all. So we also can go, we have gone, like I have gone twice to uh, Boston in Harvard to uh, um, like what I am doing here, I went there to learn about how to teach case studies. Uh, they are the masters uh, because most of the case studies that are there in the world, now there are lots of, um, lots of business schools which are writing case studies. I have also written case studies, but when we started, it was almost, Harvard was the only place. Harvard and in Canada, there is a Western Ontario um, IV school. These are the two places. IV is the case that I gave you the Amazon cases from IV. So these were the two places which used to have the cases. Um, yeah. So I will start with um, any other question. Unfortunately, I cannot, I saw there is a question or maybe comment in Indonesian. 
I cannot understand Indonesian, so only English. Uh, uh, um, okay. Um, Professor Samba, I, I mean, Professor yeah, Samba could you please uh, speak a little bit slowly? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a good comment. Uh, even my students make that comment, so uh, don't take it. I tend to speak, I get excited and tend to speak a bit fast. Um, sorry, uh, so I, I, will, uh, I will be a bit slower. So as I said, um, the plan for the workshop today is, um, I will start with an introduction to case study teaching. Um, so this today's part will be a, a bit, uh, not into details. I will just point out some of the main points and then I want to discuss this Amazon case that uh, uh, Noman has shared with you to, to bring out some of the points which are important, just to give you an example of how I teach a case. Um, unfortunately, normally uh, because of the pandemic, it is online. Normally we teach cases in person. I think case is something perhaps it works much better in person than in online because uh, compared to when I am teaching a particular uh, uh, subject, uh, case study requires a bit more interaction, question and answer, which is perhaps less, uh, 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 it doesn't work as well in uh, online. So, um, but we'll try our best to make it work. Uh, so I will teach, uh, discuss this uh, Amazon case, but don't worry, all the things that we are talking about case study teaching today, next time when we meet on July 2nd, I will go through each of them. How to, how to select cases, how to teach cases, how to evaluate cases, what type of courses, uh, what type of courses you should have more cases, uh, all these types of things, uh, we'll talk about it. Is the, is the speed okay? This speed is okay? Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. Very good. Okay. So, uh, I want to start with a. Um, I want to do a poll first. So I will uh, stop sharing and I want to do a poll. Uh, 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 oh, here I, I cannot do a poll. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I wanted to do a poll, uh, but I just wanted to know how many of you have. How many of you have um, taught a case study? How many of you have taught a case study? Anyone, can you say yes? Yes. Okay, yes. one, yes. two, yes. three. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And most of you have done a case, how many of you have never done a case study? means like forget about teaching, but you have not solved a case study. I'm guessing all, almost all of you have already solved a case study. Yes. Okay. So I will start with what is a case study? Um, so case study is a, so the main difference of case study with what we normally do in a book or something like that, this case study is a description of a real life managerial decision making situation. So you can think about the case writer, whoever is writing the case, they have taken a problem, a real life problem, and then like you can think them almost like a reporter, newspaper reporter, like a newspaper reporter, they have written the uh, case study. So the uh, most of the case study, uh, uh, if you see, let's say Harvard case studies, the Harvard case studies are written as almost like a newspaper reporter uh, type of thing. So they take a particular problem. Now this problem can be very specific problem or it can be a more general problem. The case study that, uh, the case study that we will do today, the Amazon one, it is a perhaps a bit more general. It is about uh, the whole Amazon strategy, the supply chain strategy, but it can be much more specific. There are lots of cases in Harvard which goes into much more details of a particular problem. So, uh, so it can be very specific. So there are cases, uh, I was doing a case, I, uh, just uh, uh, two weeks back, I finished teaching a course 
on inventory analytics. Uh, it's called supply chain analytics. I did a case uh, which is about very, very focused on doing forecasting and then based on the forecasting, doing inventory management. So it's a case on forecasting and inventory management for a fashion, uh, for a retailer. Um, this retailer is somewhat like a, let's say a Uniqlo or a Zara of a fast fashion retailer. And for a fast fashion retailer, how will you do um, uh, uh, forecasting and inventory management? And there, the problem, uh, the, the, the questions were much more specific, much more detailed. Um, so the, the cases can be more general or it can be more very specific with very specific questions. Um, now, uh, even if it is a specific question or a, uh, a general question, the question becomes that how is it different from a traditional material? Let's say I am teaching an inventory course. Uh, why, if I could have taught an inventory course without any cases, why I am teaching a case when I'm teaching an inventory course? Any comment? Why should I teach a case when I'm teaching an inventory course? I remember when I was taught an inventory course in my undergraduate or my master's, or even in my PhD when I took some inventory course, there was no case. This was the theory, models, uh, uh, problems, and so on. So why should I teach a case? Let's say if I am teaching, a, I'm teaching, let's say many of you teach inventory management or production it, planning and control. Why should more, I teach a case? It, it is more applicable, bro, to implement the, the case and it's easier to, for students to remember as, as well for the knowledge that we got because the, you pass through the case. So it's, it will be easier to remember rather than just traditional teach. That is the case that I experienced. Uh, any other comments? Any yes, other comments? Uh, I think the case uh, is the way to provide students uh, the contradiction view of parties in in decision making when they make decision, and this contradiction view for each parties doesn't explain in a in a regular textbook. Textbooks only provide a model, but in, to apply the model. There is a lot of decision-making process in the management team. Yes. That's my perspective. Yes. Any other, anyone else? Any other comments? I think we'll put the models and theory in the context. So student knows how to apply those models and theory in the particular context. Yeah. So, you know, so as you people, know, all people I'm mentioned, sorry. so... I think by using case study, uh, we let the students uh, to make a decision based on empirically based, and they also can uh, stimulate the students to uh, give many perspective from uh, a case. Yeah. So, so you, you people have mostly answered that question. That 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 the case study, and this is one of the. Um, uh, one of the, the biggest advantage of case study is that when, let's say I'm again, I'm going to inventory uh, uh, example because many of you teach inventory. Let's say I am teaching a EOQ model or a news vendor model. I can teach all the things that thing, but in real life, there are two things which are not, we cannot teach it in class when we teach just a model. First is in EOQ model, let's say we are holding cost. How is it? how to actually calculate holding cost in real life is not an easy thing. I, in, in a class, when you teach a model, we tell, oh, it's difficult. But when we do a case study, they have to see that how to, how to collect data for calculating the holding cost, how to, what are the problems in collecting this data? These types of things come across, which we cannot, most of the time when we teach just a model, you cannot. So the context that is important. And the second thing, which is uh, very important, I think, is and it is very, uh, very well established, especially in the Harvard uh, cases. The problem that we always have when we teach subjects, we are specialists, whether it is in manufacturing or production planning, uh, scheduling, inventory, or 
we tend to focus on when we are teaching scheduling, we only think about scheduling and nothing else. That what is, what, how can I minimize the uh, flow time? That's all. And that is my objective. But in real life, the objectives are not like that. It means like there are, in real life, there are multiple objectives. It means like never the objective is not only one thing. And, and, and the case studies, uh, case studies tell you that it is not only when you are thinking about inventory, you have to thinking about the human resource problem. You have to think about the sourcing problem. You have to think about the IT problem. So this issue of all the other problems that comes, which is not, we do not at all teach in the class. When we teach inventory, we only teach how to solve this, uh, the EOQ formula or how to find out the optimal order quantity in a news vendor or how to find out this QR model, whatever it is in scheduling, how to find out what will be the order of the things. But we, in real life, things are not like that. Every decision has other decisions that are related to it. And the case study brings it this one. Obviously, uh, so this issue of depth versus breadth, we, um, as engineers, we are very good in terms of the depth. We can go very deep into our model. But sometimes what we miss is the breadth that when we are thinking about inventory, we should think about all the other decisions, whether it is forecasting, whether it is pricing, whether it is human resource, whether it is IT, all of these things can affect what happens in inventory. And that is very important. That is comes across in a case. And this case provides those details, those data, how to make decisions. And the thing that many of you said, the trade-off that, that, that when there is nothing in real life, there is always a trade-off. There is no best optimal decision. There is, you have to always take the best possible decision, not necessarily the optimal decision. And that is very important when we are teaching a case. And that is why case study is, it is not real life. I am telling almost real life. Obviously, case study is also not real life because a uh, case study is taking a lot of real life things and making it into a story. So it is not exactly real, real life, but it is more real life than what we go in a class. And that is the biggest advantage to me of a case study. I can, rather than just teaching a model, I can put the model in a problem story, as you people said, that people understand the, uh, people will then understand the model even better. But this goes even further. People understand that when you are trying to implement this model, what will be the other things that comes into the picture when you are trying to implement this model? What are the other things you need to be careful about when you are trying to implement this model? And what in, in some of the cases, in, uh, you might not want to go to the optimal, a good enough uh, solution would be okay. Is that clear? Is it clear? Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Yes, bro. Uh, okay. So, so um, the, the, you can think about the what, how cases can help in learning that what you are saying, uh, what we were discussing, that what we teach is what. The question, we, we always, as engineers, we tend to tell what. What is the optimal, what is the optimal order quantity? What is the optimal scheduling uh, mechanism? What is the optimal uh, machine uh, 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 maintenance uh, uh, schedule and so on? But what case study brings in is the question of how, uh, how to actually do this uh, implementation in real life. And this is very much in the tradition of medicine we are very different engineering is very different medicine medicine doesn't do case study but medicine do so much of practi practical work right you have to you just you cannot just learn about heart you learn about heart by reading but then you have to do you have to do the diagnosis you have to do the surgery so this is the thing uh, which is very important case study uh, teaches you case study also teaches you about asking the correct questions this is very important when you become managers. We, we only teach as, as engineers, we, tend, we, we teach them the solution, how to, how to get the optimal order quantity. But we do, not, we do not teach them 
how to ask the questions. What is the most important question? To, and this is very important part of case study teaching. It's not only the answer. As managers, you will ultimately teach case studies to master students. And for, as a manager, when they go out and work, they will be, they have to, as managers, in addition to, they have to first ask, what is the most important question? What is the most relevant question? Before they find out the answer, they should not jump to an answer. What is the most important question to ask? And again, case study, because case study, uh, when we teach, when we teach a normal model, we tell them, this is the question. In a case study, there is no question that is directly given. You read the case study and you have to find out what is the, what is the question that is being asked. And so this finding out a question is something which is very different from a traditional engineering uh, way of teaching, where in, when you are teaching a model, you give the model and you tell, okay, this is the demand, this is the setup cost, this is the holding cost, and find out what is the optimal. So you are giving the question. In a case study, it is very important to push the students, what is the question? What is the question? What, what is the problem here? It is many of the times, the problems are not obvious in a case study. They have to go deep to find out what is the problem. Is this the, when, it, when, the, when a machine is breaking down, uh, uh, there might be a case on maintenance. They have to go, what is the problem that is creating this? Uh, one is the effect, the machine is breaking down, we need to do maintenance. But can you go deeper, what we teach in our quality? But in a case study, this type of things comes across much more easily that not only to learn about the answers, how to answer, but how to ask the correct questions. And believe me, as managers, it is very important to ask the correct question in addition to provide the correct answer. So uh, providing context and then pushing the students to ask the correct questions and then they can, once they ask the correct questions, they can use a model. Indeed, our experience is the most difficult thing for a student, especially undergraduate and to some extent masters, people who do not have experience, their biggest problem is they don't understand they are the way we teach them so many times because we always tell them what is the question. If we do not tell them the question, they have a very tough time to uh, find out what is the question. If I just tell them a problem, they have very tough time to understand what is the question that we should ask before we answer that. Okay. Yes, sir, I have a question, Professor Saibal. Yeah. Uh, do you have a certain method to guide student so the student can provide uh, can can making the right question? Yes. Do we have? So, uh, yeah. So 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 th this is when we are when we are discussing today's case and when we discuss next time. Okay. I will give you I will give you some pointers okay. about how to how to do these types of uh, how to how to push the students towards asking the correct questions. Um, uh, uh, um, okay, so I am trying to see in the chat the questions. Um, okay, one is, uh, uh, what are the criteria to assess the good quality of case study besides, for, okay, yes. So again, I will talk about how to select case study. Yes, you cannot just go by big names. There are case studies and now actually, again, I will tell you next class, Everyone, you should, uh, and for Harvard, uh, most of the times uh, uh, you can open an uh, account in Harvard for free. So you should open a Harvard. You can actually see, uh, look at a lot of cases and then decide which case is best for you. So it doesn't have to be just going by the big names. Uh, so I will talk about uh, that one also. Uh, there is a, another question. In the traditional teaching, the communication between professor and student is more one-way traffic, but it is different in the case study teaching is more interactive. So it will be take more time when we teach in case study. Sometimes we feel not enough time. Yes, absolutely. That's why, so yes, case study requires more, uh, more time. And that's why you cannot do too many case studies. Uh, so you might do 
maybe two or three in a case study. Uh, so that is again, another issue that we will talk about how many case studies should you do, what type of courses you should do more, what type of courses you should do less. Yeah, we will talk about that one also. So um, next is what are the advantages and disadvantages? So some of the things disadvantage, as I said, case study requires more time, uh, more discussion, um, so you have to, you cannot do too many case studies. So for professors, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? From a professor perspective, case studies, are, as we discussed before, are very good. You take a model and then apply it to a real world. This is a big advantage. You can show them how to apply it in real world. Disadvantage is that case study selection, case study teaching, requires very different from what we normally do. So you have to spend a bit more time, at least initially. But obviously the first time it will take a bit more time. Second time it will not take that much time. You, it will become better and better. So for professors, um, uh, that, and this is also important how to, uh, and this is what I also want to, how to make the case study cannot be a teaching. And it, this is what I am having problem now with you that because I cannot see you that case study has to be a two way, much more interaction, two way. It cannot be one way. Normally when we teach, it is much more one way. So uh, it requires more effort from the professors. For students, case study actually, they, as you people said that they actually learn a lot in terms of rather than just models, how to apply the models in the real world. But Case study, before you teach a case study, you need to teach them the theory. Uh, if you go straight to a case study without teaching the theory, then it's not, again, it's a, not a good thing. It, there has to be a balance. So I, I, again, you do not need to do a, too many case studies. You have to select two, three very good case studies and to support whatever model you are doing. Um, so, and this is the thing that will come back uh, next class what should be kept in mind while using the case study method of teaching the type of course uh, is it a is it a technical course it is a more managerial course is it a core course is it an elective course and so on all these things we'll discuss next class and uh, next time or next uh, class in the workshop about type of course you need to keep in mind when to decide uh, the case study method of teaching type of students is it undergrad or masters Within a master's, is it a full-time or part-time? Because part-time students, because they are working, they have very less time, as you know, for reading the cases. And case study teaching, unless the cases are read by the students. Because case study teaching is, the students learn a bit from the professor, but the students learn much more from the comments made by other people that someone is working in retail versus someone is working in manufacturing. One person make a comment and then another person can learn from the experience of the other students. So it's not only when I am, when you teach a normal course, the students learn from the professor. But when you teach a case study, the students learn from the professor, obviously, but the students learn from each other. Uh, and also you as a professor, learn from the students, from their experiences, especially if you are teaching um, the case studies in, uh, in classes where the students have a lot of experience, let's say part-time or uh, someone's with experience MBA, there is a lot of things to learn from the students. That next time then when you teach that case study, you can incorporate it in your cases. So it is very important, um, the type of course, the type of students. And the third one, is where and when to use that how many cases should you use where should you use at the beginning of the course middle of the course end of the course um, all these types of things has to be kept in mind so this is what we will discuss next class this type of course type of students where and when to use and the next part what we will discuss next class is these three parts in case study teaching the preparation part the preparation is what we call the foundation. This is how to select case studies. So this is before you even teach the case studies, when you are doing your course outline, how many cases should you select? Where should you go to select cases? 
uh, 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 what type of cases should you select? All these type of things. This is the preparation. And a lot of effort should go into the preparation to select a case. What do you really want to teach? What is the really want to teach? So you have to select, maybe you have to read four or five different cases and then find out, okay, this is the case that comes. It might not be exactly what you want, but it is very close to what you want. So that is the case. So you have to select the cases. So this is the preparation. So this is not the teaching part that how to, this is a selection of the cases and so on. The second is the teaching, what we call the flow, the foundation and the flow. So this is how to, how to make the students interact, how to make this push the students to ask the correct questions, how to make this, you want to, you want the students to fight in the classroom, fighting not in the sense of uh, actual fighting, but this back and forth. It should not be that everyone agrees. There has to, if it, in a good case study, someone should say yes, and someone should say no, and they should be able to defend their uh, point of view. So it is not like normal courses where there is only one answer. In most of the case studies, I tell the students, there is no perfect answer. The perfect answer, it is not like a problem where there is an answer 25. The case study, the answer can be, some people might give 15, some people the answer can be 35. As long as you can defend what you are trying to tell. And this, this type of conflict, how to do the conflict, how to interact, how to, uh, how to make students remember what is important. And the third thing is, so that is the teaching part. And that thing is that after they do the case, how you evaluate. Because as soon as you have the case, you have to have uh, uh, how to mark the case studies, how to uh, give them marks for um, participation. Those types of things you have to, so the feedback to the students, how to give feedback to the students in their case study report. So we will talk about these things. So the next, the, the next, what, the next class will be on this, what, what is there in this particular uh, slide that, that what should be kept in mind while using the case study method of teaching and what are the steps in preparing for the case study teaching in terms of before teaching, during teaching and after teaching, what are the different steps? Um, any, any questions, comments? I will take five minutes to uh, uh, whatever questions you have. Okay, uh, there is a question about in, in teaching the case study course, how many percent do we need to teach the theory? Is it better before delivering the case or within the case discussion? Um, okay, so this is, again, the issue is if, if the theory is large or long, you should not do it during uh, 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 during uh, 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 teaching. You cannot, because it will just take too much time. You should do the theory before. If it is a small thing that you can do uh, when you are uh, uh, discussing the case, but you cannot, like something like a EOQ model, you cannot teach a EOQ model when you are discussing the case. The, this has to be done before. And the case is an application of the model. Whereas if there is small thing you can discuss during the case, but in general theory should be done before the uh, case study teaching. Uh, should case studies be taken from the worst or best management practices? This is a great question. Unfortunately, it would be, the case studies would be much, much better if it is based on the failures. Um, because people can learn much more from what doesn't work rather than what work basically. So, but unfortunately, you will see there are very few cases which are based on failures. Uh, it would be great to have more cases which are based on failures. That we tried this one, it didn't work, and then analyze why it didn't work. Unfortunately, most of the cases that are written are based on the successes. That this one worked, and then, then but during the case, and this is, again, I tell, um, to, to the students, just because this company, because the students, when you do a case, the, at the end, the students will ask, oh, what did the company do? Because again, because they are, we have taught them that for every problem, there is a specific answer. 
but they have to understand I, there are some cases i tell them okay the company did this but that doesn't mean that this is the best strategy it, it could have been that you could have done even better there are something else that could have been even better just because the company did it doesn't mean that that is the correct answer so when i am evaluating the um, when i am evaluating the report it i do not go by what the company did i do i go by what is how are they asking the questions and answering the questions and supporting their answer so be very careful about and you will see when you teach the students the students will always ask what did the company did what did the company do because they think that is the correct answer because we have taught them for every problem there is a correct answer and this is one thing you need to get it out of their mind when you are teaching their case study that there is there is a somewhat of a correct answer but there is not a perfect correct answer as long as you can it again that's why i am telling case study is more about what i would call analytical thinking it's more about the thinking how how are you making the decisions what is the data you are using to make the decisions can you support your decision so i when i am evaluating the case study i do not at all look at whether the, their answer matches with what the company did i try to see are they asking the correct questions and are they answering the correct question based on what they have and um, and based on that so more about the logic and the analytical thinking rather than what the company did um yes uh, someone asks that uh, in general students meet the difficulties in, uh, so my as i was telling before uh, my experience more problem is asking the correct questions once they ask the correct questions our students especially the engineering students are very good in answering them they have problem in asking the correct questions and it is not their fault it is our fault because we have taught them that we will tell you the question you give me the answer that is how our teaching happens we will tell you the question and give me the answer not that you have to find out and this is again a part of the case study teaching i will not tell you the question you have to find out what is the question and then you have to come out to the answer uh there is a long question uh, i am teaching management most of the texts yeah so um so this is a problem even i face um i teach a supply chain course in china um fortunately there are now obviously a bit more cases written on china uh, uh but if you want to, i was trying in harvard to try to trying to find out a case i can get on uh, indonesia so that i can do a case on indonesia but it's very difficult to get a good case on uh, uh, on the local then you have to write a case you have to write your own case if you want to do that because you are absolutely right someone uh, wrote that uh, 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 um, that it is very difficult to you are absolutely right it is very difficult to get good cases um, anywhere there are some now cases on alibaba and some of the big uh, chinese companies there are some cases which have started to be written but even then it is it is not much um i teach a supply chain course in uh, china and we have this same complaints from the students that uh, you are teaching me cases which uh, okay and that's why i try to uh, here also i try to select a case which is based on a company which more or less everyone knows like i selected amazon or something like i try to select a case even in china if i select amazon or uh, facebook or something like that what everyone will know um uh, but but it, this is a problem and the solution is which someone said that if you have to write a case but writing a case is a lot of effort i have tried to write a case writing a good case is different from writing a paper you are trying to tell a story it is more about like a writing in a newspaper like writing a reporting because again you have to write almost like a story Uh, uh uh but within the story you have to give the problem you have to tell what is the problem and then and from there so that the students can find out what is the problem and so on
Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it is like orchestra conduct conductor. Um, uh, but you need to in orchestra conductor you uh, uh, the only difference between the orchestra conductor or when you are teaching case study is that in orchestra conductor you do not want you do not want uh, um, that you want everyone to uh, coordinate properly in when you are teaching a case study as i said before you want a bit of fighting fighting in the sense like back and forth uh, and i actually deliberately I deliberately try to um, make them, I, I try to tell them a point of view. I know that many people, I, I myself will not believe it. And, but I will only make the comment so that there is a fighting that happens because th that is the only time you bring out, uh, you bring out um, uh, uh, the different point of view. You need to bring out different point of view. And another problem, which is you will face when I teach in, um, when I teach in um, uh, China, I have this problem. Uh, I do not know in your classes. Um, as you know, uh, in the cultural perspective, uh, the, in Asian culture, people are not used to asking questions, are not used to going against the professors. Uh, that whatever the professor is telling is the correct one. Again, you have to break from this mold. Uh, you have to tell them that, yes, I am, as a professor, when I am teaching a case, when I am teaching a model, whether it is, again, I am my, by the way, my background is inventory management. So I am using the inventory management expertise, uh, 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 terminologies, you can use it, anything. So when I am teaching a EOQ model, there is no question, this is the model, this is the way. But when I am teaching a case study, I said that I am, I do not have the answer. I am as good, like I have some, I will ask you the questions, but the answer will come from the discussion. And, and the, because of the culture, Asian culture, sometimes people are very hesitant to ask these questions. And again, this requires you to push, this requires you to push um, uh, the people. Um, so how long it takes? Um, it, a good case study discussion, obviously it can go on for seven, eight hours, but a good case study discussion, less than 40, 45 minutes, it will not work. At least 45 minutes, a good 70, 75 minutes is enough to discuss relatively okay. Because what you want, what you want is a case study that you do not want to discuss a lot of points. Maybe in your mind, you have seven, eight points. If you can discuss three or four of these points, well, that's enough. You do not have to, so it is better on quality. You go on three, four points, a go discuss well rather than seven eight points and just touch on it so you have to uh, so you if you have 70 75 minutes it's enough to you uh, how long is the normal class uh, class time for a normal class in your uh, ITS what is the normal class time uh, one hour 40 minutes for, for okay, to create. perfect perfect so uh, for us also our class uh, 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 in in our MBAs, our classes are one and a half to two hours, roughly around that uh, time. So 90 to 120. So, um, or sometimes we have in our master's program, we have three hour classes. But if I have three hour classes, it's not that I do all three hour one case. I do half a class on theory. Let's say uh, first 80 minutes, I do theory. Then there is a 10 minute break. And then again, I do 80, 85 minutes of uh, case study. So. Uh, if I have 70 to 80 minutes, I can discuss a case quite well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, another question, how to teach a case study to students from many different backgrounds. So I am not concerned about when they have different backgrounds. The more concern is my problem is not so much. So uh, when I am teaching, uh, um, uh, Newman, you told me that uh, many of the courses that you are going to teach, are will be the part time students right in the yes. Uh, uh, yes so i teach i teach part, we have a program called part time mba um, where the students come from very different industries that's not a problem my problem happens when i have in the class which we do not have much but sometimes we have a students we we have students from undergraduate 
we have students from uh, analytics programs and we have students from MBA program. And then it's a problem. It's not so much about the different backgrounds in terms of different industries. That's perfectly okay. I actually want that people come from different industries because they can learn from each other. It is not interesting if everyone comes from semiconductor manufacturing industry because then they are, if you are teaching a course with everyone is in the, uh, in the class is from semiconductor manufacturing, they will not think about anything else. They are all they know about their whole life is semiconductor manufacturing. So I want in the class that there is a variety of background. Someone comes from supply chain, someone comes from manufacturing, someone comes from uh, uh, maybe pure service industries, consulting companies, someone comes. So all these different types of companies, that's great because then it really increases. And we will, I will talk about in the next class, one of the things that you need to do in preparation is to go into details of, to understand what is the background of each of the students. Because once you have a background, you can actually, so let's say you are doing a, a manufacturing case and you know that in the class, there are these four students who have significant manufacturing background. Then you can ask, first start the class, start the class by asking them the questions. So you need to, we actually, at the beginning of the course, and this is for all professors, not only for me, the, the program, let's say our MBA program, gives us a detailed background of each of the students. Um, what, is their, uh, what is their degree? What is their undergraduate degree? What is, where did they work? What was their work? What are their hobbies? What are the other things? So we, for each of the students, we have, let's say one to two pages of a short CV so that we know what is their background. And we study that before we go to class because then it becomes, again, I can ask them, oh, I know that you have worked in, let's say semiconductor manufacturing. So you should have some in that. Then I ask, okay, you do not have any experience in semiconductor manufacturing. You are coming from banking, but what do you think about this? Can you see anywhere th that, even if the case is on manufacturing, can you learn something from manufacturing that you can use in banking? Or can you learn something in manufacturing that you can uh, use it in transportation? So th that, is, that is an extremely good thing. So I have no problem in teaching. Um, and I actually want people from different backgrounds uh, in terms of the industries. What I don't like when they are different levels, undergraduate, even within masters, there are MBAs that have different one way of thinking and the people in the analytics program have a different way of thinking. So that creates a more of a problem for me rather than different backgrounds, basically. Uh, total number of students. I personally like uh, uh, what is a ideal class size for teaching a case. I like 35, 40, but believe me, you can teach a case. I know Harvard, most of the core courses in Harvard, they teach in classes of 1995 and they teach much better than me, uh, that case. So, uh, it, it, so we think that small class sizes are better. Actually, I do not want very small class sizes. If, if the class size is 15 or 20, I don't think there is not much because anytime you are teaching a case, you will think there will be 50% of the students who will not participate. I mean, you would want, but they will not participate either because they have not read the case, at least this particular course, they are not interested. There are some people who are quiet and so on. So if you have, if you have a class, class of 20 students and 50% are not participating, there are 10 students. And then these 10 students always talk, it's the same 10 students talk. And that's not interesting. So ideally you should have, let's say 35, 40. I cannot teach uh, uh, case studies in a class of 60. It's very difficult for me, but it is, I am not telling it is not possible. I know that Harvard teaches case studies in classes of 90 uh, and so on very, very well. Um, yes, uh, not reading the case. I, 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 how many times you tell 50% of the students will still not read the case. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, but, and they, as you know, there are some students who think they are extra smart so they will not read the case, but based on whatever the discussion is going on, they will make comments. Uh, they have no problem in making comments, but without having any idea about what the case is about. <laughs> uh, so um, they will make comments, uh, 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 but uh, so 
that is one of the biggest problems and that is a big problem for us in our part time in our part time program this is our biggest problem because the students as you know these students are working the whole time and then taking this particular program whatever is the program and they do not have any time to read these things and so sometimes they make when they read the case the part time students are the best because they are actually working they are facing these problems but the only problem is that they do not have time to read the case so uh, that that's a problem we are also facing we are trying our best to try to reduce the number of cases try to tell them okay let's just do two or three cases very well when we are in our full time program maybe we are doing five cases in our part time program we are doing two cases uh, and so on again any other questions comments um uh, case studies for individuals or groups um um so the discussion happens in the class individually but when they are writing report uh, they normally write the reports in groups um uh, but sometimes i give them exam so i have an exam where i i give them a case they have 3 hours to write a report on the case so that is the exam the exam is case study based so i give them a case and they have 3 hours to find out what is the problem and write a report on that problem uh so but 3 hours is for analysis i give 4 hours total 1 hour to read the case and then 3 hours to analyze the case so uh, total 4 hours exam any other questions comments okay um so i will i will i wanted to um uh, uh, discuss this amazon case so let's say we were we we are complaining about the students how many of you have read the case so uh, <laughs> i hope most of you have read the case um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes yes um okay so again i am sorry i i, I totally understand and some of uh, one of uh, uh, some of you have raised this issue i really um even i thought uh, how do you how, how do you name the company gojek how do you tell the company gojek gojek yes gojek i thought that given that it is it has become very famous there will be some case on gojek in harvard but i i could not find any case on gojek actually mm. uh so um uh, i that's why i went for a at least i went for a company amazon so that most of you at least no one the, is amazon active in indonesia or not yeah yes it is active yeah, very popular very oh popular. very popular okay yeah. so so at least that's why i uh, but but this is a problem as uh, some of you have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, some of you have raised if there are not uh, there are not many cases uh, uh, written um you uh, you can write your own case you can write uh, uh, with uh, again i i i have written a uh, number of cases um both with uh, companies as well as with ngos we have written some cases but uh, writing cases is difficult okay so uh, without uh, i will try to um uh, 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 discuss this case we have roughly let's say an hour or so a bit less but uh, let's uh, uh, discuss this case um so what do you think is what do you think is the case about any comments what do you think is the case about this is the massive change of the company from the uh, online uh, to the handling all kind of thing related with the supply chains even the payment the warehouse and the product as well from starting from selling selling book and then electricity electronic and then everything inputting the payment system also the courier they handle it that is basically uh, i i read this uh, case actually the summary at the ex exhibit number 6 this <laughs> uh, the uh, the evolution of the supply chain of the amazon so that's yes. that's that the key i think yeah um so by the way um when i teach this case in my i teach this case in my mba course uh, not mba uh, this supply chain analytics course 
which is our elective course. So I do two cases. So I do Amazon and I do Walmart and I do, I do them in two consecutive classes. One class I do Amazon, one class we do at Walmart and the, in order to show them the, uh, the, this, this issue of only channel. So uh, this is, and okay, so I will, and this is the thing. So let's start asking the questions. So what do you think, is Amazon a technology company or a logistics company? They are combined both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> They're starting with the technology, but and then they start uh, in the supply chains as well. They what? try to grab all things from the uh, downstream until upstream. They try to handle all of these things. But okay, so think about you are you are the you are the main consultant to Jeff Bezos. So, and. It means like Amazon is has, has become as, as a size, they cannot become, they cannot go on being both. At certain point, they have to make this decision. So what do you think? Again, at this point, at this point, what do you think? Is it both is a both is a is an easy way out? I I want you to push. You have to make a choice. Is it a technology company or is it a logistics company? Just take a thing. Technology. Technology. Okay. You are saying technology. technology. Okay. How many logistic. people want anyone who tells logistics? Logistic. Logistic. Okay. Anyone among the people who tell logistics, and this is so this is where it is much easier when I'm in a classroom because I can see who is telling logistics and who is telling technology. Um so among the people who Sorry, are telling Professor Rai. Sorry, Professor Rai. Is it also, one tools that you try to explain the correct question, the selecting correct question. This is the way. Yes, exactly. So, right. so this is what. Uh, so this is where you have to push them. I again and again, as you know. So this is a question. There is no correct answer. Obviously, you cannot make up. But I am pushing you. Obviously, many of you say that it is a mix of technology and logistics. Actually, it is like that. But if if you tell if it's a mix mix of technology and logistics, then there will be no. There will be no fighting. I want the fight that why wh I want someone who is telling logistics. One of those tell me why logistics are not technology. Tell me why okay. logistics are not technology. Anyone who whoever supported yeah. logistics. <laughs> yes, I am. I say, oh, this. Yeah, I think Amazon is log logistic company because first time uh, Amazon. Uh, sold a uh, book yeah. Uh, they su uh, supply. They has a supply chain for books, and then uh, develop become uh, bigger and more company uh, that they develop during the yeah the time until uh, the Amazon has five or six uh, company after that yeah. i would i would say in the beginning it is technology company and then they transform to be logistic company okay uh, and why would why would you uh, 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 so so if you are a logistics company let's say those people who are telling logistics so who are who, who do you consider amazon's um, amazon's competitor who is a competitor of Amazon? So um, if, I, if I think, who is a competitor to Amazon? Walmart. Walmart, Target. And be FedEx. Yeah, so, but if it is a logistics company, FedEx should be the competitor, right? Not Walmart yeah. or Target. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, uh, those who are telling technology company, so why is it a technology company? In my opinion, Professor Ray, I think uh, uh, Amazon is utilizing technology as an enabler to, to expand the business. Uh, that's why they need the, the support of technology to be able to uh, expand the business. But the original business, the core is actually the logistic. That's what okay. I can understand. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So that is the truth. I, I'm not questioning that is the truth. But again, 
because the technology company so if it is a technology company um so think about i am just giving you a data which is not there in the case but so this is the type of thing um let's say facebook it's a technology company right so right. what is the what is the average salary of a facebook what is the average salary in a facebook average salary of facebook is 200000 us dollar median not average not uh, uh, mean median is 200000 210000 us dollar what is the median salary of amazon what do you think what is the median median salary of amazon in us in us the median salary of facebook is 200 or 210000 us dollar what is the median salary of amazon can be higher 28000 us dollar wow because almost 80% of amazon's workforce is actually logistics workforce in warehousing and in distribution so if you see again as you said that obviously technology is the enabler but the thing is that a workforce is it's still a logistics works force where the technology so the, again there is no correct answer uh, ultimately the answer is that that it is using technology for logistics it is te using technology for logistics but uh, what i want to get at more than the solution is this this is how you have to push the students you have to push the students you cannot tell the students the students will always try to take the way out or there it is a both a technology and a logistics company but you have to force the students take one side not because the one side is the correct there is no it's not a technology company it's not a logistics company but just to force them to think about is it if it's a logistics company who should it be its competitor does jeb bezos think the fedex or ups to be its competitor or yeah. does if it is a logistics if it's a technology company perhaps it should think uh, 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 apple or uh, 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 facebook or uh, google to be its competitor just jeb bezos jeb bezos think them to be the competitor or it, it turns out that most of you think the biggest competitor to uh, uh, walmart is um, uh, a biggest competitor to amazon is walmart or alibaba or a uh, 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 target if it is like that then they are a retail company mm. yeah. so 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 you have to again i am i'm just trying to give you an example of how to ask the questions to think about to push them to think about how to uh, think again let's another question what is how how amazon became why is amazon so popular let's say from your experience in uh, 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 experience in indonesia why is amazon so popular i think because he is the first in the in, in the industry okay first to in the industry the, to offer the uh, online uh, purchasing and also to online su supplies yeah. okay uh, first in the industry uh, 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 but after that what is what is so great today so uh, obviously it is the first in the industry but now there are almost all these retail arts uh, uh, and as we know amazon was not actually uh, successful in china that much uh, 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 and amazon had to get out of china it sold uh, because of the alibaba and jd and so on so why why what what is what is the thing about amazon what is the if you think from amazon how does its business model work why is it so successful in terms of the business model uh, i think because uh, they do uh, vertical integrations so firstly it is a uh, it is the uh, store online store and then uh, they develop the business uh, logistic and then also and the last they uh, use the what is as as a side shipping company So, okay. Uh, okay, I understand. Anyone, any comments? So, what what do you think after you read the case? What do you think? And I do not know. I, I, again, I am trying to see that how whether you have read the case very carefully. That what is what is Amazon's how what is the Amazon's business model? What drives Amazon's business model versus a Walmart business model? 
I think Amazon is more active on the M&A rather than uh, focus on online first. Because that's why they try to expand the business by merger and acquisition. That's why now they spread out all over the world. But but again, Amazon, uh, I am pushing back and don't mind me, please. I, I, I'm trying to push back, yes. please uh, don't mind. But what the, give me an example of M&A. Yeah, Where? they bought some, some business like uh, for uh, clothing and also from recording and this kind of thing. So yeah, now they but, are trying to complete their store. Yeah, but compared compared to most of the competitors, actually they have not done too much M and A. Means compared to the compared to the most of the other competitors, the big players, they have not done too much uh, M and A, 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 a uh, mergers and acquisitions proportionally. I, again, I'm not telling they have not done. They have done some. They have bought this Kiva Robotics. They have bought the some of the logistics companies. But proportionally, they are. Uh, relatively low. So I think the, uh, Amazon success to develop the planogram with the, the planogram because he, with, the, with this planogram they can uh, give uh, data with recommendation to be buyers. So okay. that's why it's easier to them to get the right target because they have the planogram. But but again, so 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 this is. Today, so you are thinking about Amazon's today. Yes, today Amazon is a big player. It has a lot of a um, lot of uh, 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 customers and lot of products. But it that is today. But how did Amazon come to this level? So that that is the question. It, it's not like Amazon suddenly started with uh, today. Amazon there is a data uh, uh, in that case. Uh, uh, okay. So I want to share, uh, I'm stopping and I'm, I'm going to share something else. One minute. Can you see this one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is from the... This is from the case, right? Yes. If you see the exhibit three in the case, so Amazon's Amazon's business model versus uh, Walmart's business model, and so you see that for Amazon, the most important is this point of selection, what they call selection, how many products they are selling. This is very important for them. They actually Amazon is very different from Walmart. Walmart tends to Walmart's number of products is much lower because again, Walmart traditionally, and why Walmart's products, number of products is much lower? Why? Why Walmart's number of products is much lower? Why do you think Walmart's number of products, what, the, the amount of product Amazon sells is roughly the SKUs, no, you know the assortments, like the number of different types of products that Amazon sells is roughly 15 to 20 times of uh, 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 Walmart. So why? Because they put all of those products in the storage and physical store. Exactly. Physical store, because Walmart has to put in physical store, physical store, the, uh, the self space is extremely expensive. Mm. But the Amazon, there is no physical store. They are putting, they are putting it in their warehouse where the warehouse is in a much cheaper place, the rental cost is much lower than the self space, or sometimes they don't even stock because they act as an, we'll come to this issue, how Amazon's business model is changing. So the, how the Amazon's business model is changing, I will come to that, but sometimes they don't even stock because they take the order from the customer and they put it to the manufacturer so that manufacturer stocks it and delivers directly to the customer. So Amazon can, stock a much, much larger quantity of uh, uh, product. And that's why if you see that for, if you see the model, sorry, one minute. Uh, oh, my pain is not working somehow. Uh, so, if you see that this here, one of the most important thing for uh, uh, is selection, that how many different products that Amazon has. Because for Jeff Bezos, the selection is more important. 
the more the selection the better the customer experience the customers will get what they want if the customers get what they want it will attract even more customer the traffic if there is traffic this is it will attract more sellers so this issue of and this brings me to the other thing how do you think amazon's and this brings me how do you think amazon's business model is changing how do you think amazon's business model is changing what is happening to amazon's business model what are the things that is changing amazon's business model what do you think amazon's business model and again there is an indi indication in the case i think what there are think three, three types of relationship they refer it to first party second party and third party uh, exactly so so which is re related to uh, okay yeah now it's work so this issue of if you see here this issue of uh, selection the selection is very important for amazon because this more the selection it gives customer experience that brings in traffic that brings in sellers and that more sellers means more selection and once if there is this lot of selection and lot of traffic that that because of the volume you get lower cost lower cost mean lower prices it will even create more better uh, customer experience so that is so now there are two things amazon is doing Amazon is becoming more of a platform. So what is a platform? So again, what is Amazon started as a pure online company, pure online retailer. And how what how how did Amazon how did Amazon work initially think about initially when Amazon started? How it how, how is the business model of Amazon used to work? How did the business model of Amazon used to work initially? What do you think? How did Amazon work initially? Huh? Initially, how did Amazon work? Amazon used to be here as a retailer, and then it was their manufacturer. It was taking the products from the manufacturer, and then it was giving to the consumers. Right? Yeah. Is it clear? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes. so this was the original model now amazon is deciding that i do not want to so this is a model which amazon used what is the what is the bad thing about this model what is the disadvantage of this model what is the disadvantage of this model what is the disadvantage of this model uh it's it is the practice of vertically integrated so so it's not good for market governance point of view yes what else what else if i want to, if amazon let's say amazon yes. today sells 1000 products now amazon wants to sell 100000 products once it goes from 1000 to 100000 amazon how difficult will it be if it is using this model if it is Let's using see. this model ah uh, coordination it is very difficult to go from 1000 products to 10 100000 products because yeah. inventory cost will become extremely high because they have to collect, carry the inventory for all this ones so what do you think amazon is more and more trying to do what do you think amazon is more and more trying to do collaboration what is huh collaboration Colla not collaboration it is trying to become a more of a alibaba type of it is trying to become a platform if you see it is becoming a platform okay i i will not carry inventory so even in the case and so in the case they are saying in 2017 for the first time more than 50% of the products that are sold on amazon are from third party sellers and this third party sellers means so what is the thing third party sellers means amazon is not selling the product amazon is not selling the product it's a third party some other retailer which is selling the product to the consumer what is amazon's role what is amazon's role what is amazon's role 
in the platform. When it's a platform, what is Amazon's role? Facilitator. Exactly. There is a seller and the buyer. Amazon's act as a facilitator. And Amazon, in that case, Amazon is becoming more like Uber or something like that. It is just as a facilitator. In Uber, it is drivers and riders. In Amazon, it is buyers and sellers. Okay. And in that case, and so Amazon is becoming more like Alibaba. Alibaba is a facilitator. Alibaba yeah. is not a retailer. So this is where Amazon is now going back to this question. Is Amazon a technology company or a retail company oh. or, or a logistics company? As platform becomes a more of a more of a part of Amazon, it is becoming more of a technology company. When you are a platform, Uber is a technology company because Uber doesn't own any asset. Uber's most important role is to just using the technology to connect the buyers and sellers, to, uh, to, uh, to make the safe transactions, financial transactions, payment systems. But whereas Amazon initially was not a platform, Amazon was a retailer. So at that time, it was more of a logistics company. So it started more of a logistics company because as a retailer, logistics is very important because you have to collect the inventory, you have to sell the inventory. But they saw that when you are trying to be a retailer, when you try to be a logistics, growth, growing from growing from 1,000 items to 100,000 items, it is extremely expensive. It is extremely expensive. I have a question, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most likely, the, the, the business of retailers, which is in the downstream, is most likely they want to go to upstream, which is they want to have their own brand and also their own uh, manufacturing facility. But why Amazon choose to be stay in their downstream as a supply no. chain or as a retailers? What do you think? Amazon, Amazon is going. Amazon has a lot of, again, another thing which the, uh, the case talks about store brands. Amazon mm. is coming up with its own store brands. You mean home brands? Home brands, uh, yeah. So okay. it, it, it's called store brands or it's called private labels or store brands or home brands. So Amazon, because Amazon, can, Amazon is becoming, so Amazon obviously has now become such a big player. It, it, is, it knows that it is getting a lot of data from the consumers. What consumers like, what consumers don't like. And using that data, it is trying to develop, design new product in order to, it's, and that is actually is creating a lot of trouble because now a lot of suppliers to Amazon are telling that Amazon, suppose Amazon has a product, let's say battery, let's say battery. If, if there is a company which sells battery, let's say company A sells battery and Amazon has its own battery. Amazon is trying to push its own battery more than the, uh, uh, this this other the one which was originally the retailer and because amazon now amazon is not only a retailer amazon is a manufacturer also so it's it's a competitor because amazon has its own product which is called the store level product but going back to this issue of platforms platform if you can do this platform business it is a great business to work because platform business going from 1,000 to 100,000 items, you just add more suppliers because you do not carry the inventory. You are just connecting the suppliers to the buyers. The growth is much easier. Growth is much easier when you are a platform. And when you go from a, when you go from a retailer to a platform, Retailer, any retailer is a more of a logistics company because logistics is an extremely big part of retailing. But once you become from a retailer to a platform, you become more of a technology company because in a, in a, uh, 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 for, a, for a platform, the logistics is not important. Platform, what is more important is the technology, is the uh, payment system, 
the uh, 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 to make sure the suppliers and the buyers are evaluated properly they are safe they are uh, 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 the good quality and so on and this is what amazon is trying because amazon knows if it wants to grow big without carrying inventory it has to become from a retailer to a platform it, it cannot grow big by being a retailer i have a question sir so which there is a question which part of the case tells us the transition from retailer to pl platform yes. provider the case where it tells what percentage of the items is third party sellers when okay. is third party third party sellers is the more the third party sellers that means amazon is working as a platform connecting the third party sellers to the customers and that is amazon so amazon is uh, uh, amazon is changing its uh, strategy in two ways one amazon is becoming going back to this question that we started with that amazon is uh, uh, started as a retailer which is i would consider a logistics company but amazon saw that um it, 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 the, uh, retailing is a very difficult uh, business especially if you want to sell millions and millions of products because if you are wanting to sell millions and millions of products and if you want to be a retailer you have to in your warehouse at least you have to stock these millions and millions of items so in order to become in order to give this choices in order to give this selection to the amazon uh, uh, to the customers the only way is if i become a platform where i can attract millions of suppliers rather than stock millions of items and that is why if you go to amazon's website it will tell sold by amazon or sold not sold by amazon it is sold by another company yes amazon amazon still wants to be a logistics indeed amazon has started a new again in the case they say amazon started a new business called fba fulfill fulfillment by amazon so many of these uh, suppliers the suppliers are good but the suppliers are not good in logistics amazon is good in logistics already so amazon is telling the suppliers you produce the product i will handle the logistics for you and i will take a money out of it so if again if you see the case there is a, a question in the chat will the platform turn off logistics it will not turn off logistics amazon is trying to make the logistics a separate business which is a totally separate part which is called again if you see the case it's called fba fulfillment by logist uh, fulfillment by amazon here amazon is not the manufacturer the supplier amazon is only the logistics provi provider so that is one thing so again Am this is a very deliberate strategy by amazon to go from a, a retailer to a platform provider and that means amazon is moving from a logistics company to a more uh, a technology company um what is other thing uh, amazon is doing again if you read the case what is the other thing amazon is doing what is the biggest mergers and acquisitions going back to the m&a what is the biggest m&a that amazon has done in recent times uh it's also handling the payment the big payment data management ha huh? big data management if you if you see uh, if you see this uh, uh, um if you see the in the case exhibit 4 amazon's products and services so one of the main thing is whole foods you know whole foods whole food is a grocery retailer yeah and it is a physical grocery retailer amazon bought it uh, paying i think 16 billion dollars and so that is the thing so that is so amazon on the one hand amazon is becoming so amazon started as a online retailer as a online retailer then on the one hand it is still to some extent online retailer 
But on the one hand, they started pushing more and more this platform business. Another side, they wanted to get into physical retail through Whole Foods. And what do you think? Why do you think Amazon is going into uh, physical retail? What, are the, what is the main reason? What do you think? I think because uh, Amazon is trying to do the omni-channel by trying to serve the customer for both retailers and non uh, both the virtual or non or physical customer. Yeah. And so why, why, uh, yes, omni-channel. So why Whole Foods? Why Whole Foods? Because maybe the, uh, the, the number of branches, the number of stores is quite massive in the U.S. Okay. Besides so the I number of AU as well. So, uh, so let me answer. So this is where you have, to, you have to push it. So, okay, number of branches, that might be a reason. So uh, we discussed Amazon originally was an online retailer. What is the right. primary difference between online retailing and offline retailing? What do you think is the primary difference? The physical of the inventory. Okay. T t tell me again, let's, let's go details. What is the difference between online retailing and offline retailing? What do you mean by carrying inventory? What do you mean? Yeah, because uh, 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 conservative, I mean, most likely the customer at the time still believe to, to see and to touch the product before they make the selection. But the online, they need the uh, facility like internet and this kind of online connection to to this kind of uh, online uh, business okay. as well. Yeah, so so one is in one case, but again, from a business perspective, from a business model perspective, if I draw uh, online retailing versus offline retailing, what is the main difference? Storage. You mean the access? Because online can access more uh, number of customer without boundary about the boundaries and also the location. Okay, um, that might be one reason. But again, from a business perspective, if let's say Amazon, Amazon versus Walmart, let's say to uh, Walmart obviously also has an online, but let's say Walmart is mostly physical, Amazon is mostly online. What is the biggest advantage of Amazon compared to Walmart? What is the biggest advantage of Amazon compared to Walmart in terms of the one is, as you said, one is rich. It can reach much more uh, 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 people. What is other advantage of Amazon? Uh, number of products. Number, number of products, product. number can, of customer. Number of products, number of customers. What else? What is, the, what is the other advantage of Amazon? Cost, because they don't have to uh, have uh, assets like a building and also the inventory like a physical Walmart. Okay. So yes. So these are the three, the, the two, uh, perhaps the three biggest uh, 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 advantage of online retailing are these three. You can, you can, so this is how, when you are teaching a case, you have to, you, when you, we do not have a blackboard, but if you had a blackboard, you should write these three down. One is you can sell a lot of different products because physical, the physical constraint, space constraint is not there. You can yeah. reach a lot of customers because again, anyone from anywhere can theoretically approach you because that it's not like, and the third is the cost reduction, both because of the asset reduction, because you do not asset and uh, human resources also, because you do not require so many uh, cashiers and so on, so many building stores you asset, and also inventory because you do not need to keep the inventory in, um, uh, 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 in uh, different stores, but you keep the inventory in warehousing. I do not want to give, but if you are teaching this case in inventory management, you can connect it to risk pooling because in, in inventory management, we teach risk pooling and we can, we can show them that actually Amazon through risk pooling by warehousing and in online retailing through warehousing, you can reduce the amount of inventory compared to uh, Walmart where they have to keep it in different uh, levels. So you can connect it to inventory, how, how uh, risk pooling I can reduce the inventory uh, for Amazon. So yes, online retailing, great. What is the biggest problem in online retailing? What is, like if, if online retailing, is, 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 all these things are great about online retailing, what is the disadvantage? 
of online retailing. Yes, the uh, connection. Professor, Professor Saibel, the customer yeah. cannot get the product that they want uh, directly. They have to wait. Okay, one is the waiting. So the biggest problem is the waiting. In order to reduce the waiting, what is the main thing you have to do? What is the main thing you have to do in, in order to reduce the waiting? To ensure that we uh, have um, provide um, exact amount of inventory on hand in your suppliers. But more than that, what is the biggest problem? What, what do you think after reading the case? What is, it's inventory. Let's say I have the inventory. I have perfect inventory. What is the problem? What is the, one of the main differences? I, again, going back, what is the main difference in an online and offline retailing other than the things that we discussed? What is another main difference? One is you said that people have to wait, but because of the wait, what is the other difference between online and offline retailing? You need a delivery service from your supplier to your customers. Exactly. So this is the main main thing. You have, and so again, when you are analyzing a case, you have to push the people. What is the main difference? That the main difference in one of the biggest differences in online versus offline is that in offline retailing, customers are coming to the store. In online retailing, you are going to the customer. And not only you are going to the customer, you are going to individual customers. You are, you, are, you are supplying each packet to a particular customer, which is called the, which is called, which is called the last mile delivery, the last mile delivery problem. And in, the biggest problem in online delivery is the last mile delivery logistics problem, which is actually for many of the online companies, it is worth 20%, 25% of the total cost. It's a hugely costly business, but it is an extremely important one because as, as you people mentioned, one of the biggest disadvantages of online retailing is people have to wait. And in order to make sure that the people are don't wait long, uh, you need to make this uh, delivery quickly. And in order to make this delivery quickly, you have to even invest even more. And that is the thing, If you, again, if you go, to, I am, uh, 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 I am one minute. Uh, I want to open uh, the case and trying to show the case. Ah, okay. I am again sharing the screen. So you see, You can see the screen? Yes. Uh, okay. So if you see the cost, Amazon's cost structure, again, from the best, uh, uh, based on the data that, that, that is given in the case, you see this table. In 2011, fulfillment expenses, fulfillment ex expenses was uh, uh, around 40 point, uh, 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 fulfillment, uh, yeah, sorry, fulfillment expenses as percentage of sales, it was around 11%. So fulfillment expenses means like warehousing and delivery expenses. In Amazon's initially in 2011, what it was 11% of sales. In 2017, it is 21% of sales. So actually, because the last mile delivery, you see the year over year growth. This is the product sales product sales is increasing at this level and fulfillment expenses are increasing at a much, much faster level. And this is the biggest problem for Amazon. Amazon saw that in online retailing, in order to be online retailing, to be well, you have to invest a lot in last mile delivery. Last mile delivery in terms of your logistics, your new, uh, in trucks, new trucks, new logistics, new warehousing, new distribution center, all of this. And this is an extremely costly endeavor. Now, Amazon is spending a lot of money. And especially, now going back to this thing, especially what type of products this cost is most, uh, most uh, mo uh, uh, the largest proportion. What is the product where this cost is very, very high, fulfillment expenses? What type of product? What do you think, what type of product the logistic cost will be very, very high? Okay, items. Uh, yeah, perishable item. 
like food very, or fruit perishable heavy items so if you think about electronics items where the product cost is let's say you are delivering a, a, a i do not know a, a phone a iphone a iphone is a thousand dollar product and the cost of delivery might be ten dollars versus if you are if you are uh, 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 delivering a cabbage which is very heavy uh, the logistic the proportionally the logistics cost is a very high proportion of the overall cost and so amazon saw the physical return is most important for grocery grocery is the area because it is perishable it is low cost and it is heavy where the fulfillment expenses are extremely high it is not so high in electronics or in other things and that is why they they are the reason they went for again it's not a question of whole foods they specifically wanted to have a grocery retailer because the grocery retailer because the grocery is the business they think where physical retail they're going by this only channel they think electronics they think electronics is very good in uh, pure online they don't think grocery is good pure online they want grocery to be much more offline than online because in again the reason is that in the grocery business logistics cost is extremely high and that is why it is very difficult to manage pure online grocery business and that is the reason for them to go to physical there is another reason amazon was having amazon wanted physical infrastructure for grocery uh, for one is grocery another is returns another problem of online uh, business is returns in a physical you can go to the store and return in online you have to the return cost is extremely high return logistics cost so if again if you have this physical thing in us where the whole foods are there they are using this whole foods not only for the grocery they are also using the whole foods for two other purposes they are using the whole foods for as a collection point for returns so if you want to you can go to the whole foods to your nearest whole foods and return it there and the second is they are also using the whole foods as a distribution center so they are in order to reduce the uh, last mile delivery cost they are saying that i will give you a 5% discount if i do not have to deliver to you if you come to the nearest whole foods and pick it up let's say even iphone if you can come electronics and pick it up in the whole foods i will give you a 5% discount so the reason for them to go to physical retail is to reduce their fulfillment expenses especially their last mile delivery cost and this is extremely important especially for the grocery business and for returns because these are the two places where uh, this logistics last mile delivery cost and the returns these are the two things where online is weaker than offline almost everything else online is stronger than offline their biggest problem of online is returns and another is uh, uh, the last mile delivery cost and again now if you want to connect it if you are teaching a logistics course you can actually go into much more details about last mile delivery i am not going but why is last mile delivery so complicated you can get into this traveling if you are teaching a, a logistics course you can teach that how it's a, even a simple traveling salesman's problem is so complicated and in a last mile delivery it is much much more complicated than a traveling salesman problem so you can actually go to show in a logistics course why last mile delivery is uh, so and again if you want to i am i am doing this course on amazon there is case in uh, uh, harvard which focuses on only the last mile delivery problem of amazon in the grocery business so that is so this perhaps this case is not good the case that we are discussing perhaps is not a good case for logistics that case is much better for logistics because that is purely on the transportation and the logistics why is last mile delivery so problematic especially in the uh grocery business uh professor ray yeah uh beside the point that you have been uh, mentioned uh recently uh, can we add another perspective like bringing other issues like customer behavior and this kind of thing 
just to Absolutely. add on and complement for this discussion. What is yes, uh, yes. So the thing is that again, I, I am I do not have much time, but so they are we have to you have to absolutely and again depending on who is teaching depending on the type of course if you are teaching a logistics course perhaps you should put more focus on the last mile delivery part if you are teaching the inventory course perhaps you can focus more on this risk pooling part if you are teaching a more general course perhaps you can go or if you are it's a more marketing oriented type of course or you can go into more customer behavior how is a customer behavior different in online and offline all these things you can Again, you cannot touch. Remember, again, I wanted to, and I will come to this issue next class also, that you cannot cover all uh, items. You have to decide what to cover and what not to cover. And, and that is that will depend on how much time you have. That will depend on how the discussion is going. Sometimes you start a discussion and you will see the students are not interested. Then you have to quickly and you, you, here, in, in online, this is very difficult to do because I cannot see you. But if you are teaching in a class, you can see the faces of the students and you can see they are not paying attention to you. Then you, that means that is a point which is not of interest. So you should quickly finish it and go to the next point. So depending on the type of the course, depending on whether it is interest or not, you have to, you have to focus on, and if again, maybe last mile delivery become gets into a very, very nice discussion on the logistics issues, on the how to, uh, what is the transportation issues, which type of, should we use motorcycles or trucks? When should you use trucks? What should you use drones? What type of, day? it might get into a very, very nice discussion. Then if it is really a discussion, you should allow the discussion, even if you cannot, if you cannot cover one or two points that you plan to cover, don't worry about it. It is, it is good that the, uh, the students remember one or two things very well rather than they 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 hear about six things but they forget everything <laughs> so so it is extremely important to focus on two to three things again my experience you if if you can make them understand two to three things you are perfect uh, 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 or make them remember two to three things and so again, when I am teaching this case, depending on whether I'm teaching it in a logistics course or an inventory course or a strategy course or a marketing course, I will teach it in slightly different ways. Where will I focus on? And again, means like when I'm teaching it in a retail course, I go into this only channel that how a company like uh, Amazon, which started with online is going to uh, uh, offline Whereas a company like, and I, I teach it with Walmart, which started as an offline, how it is going online. And so uh, how this, every company is, you can think about omnichannel is almost like a line. At one end is pure online, another end is pure offline. And everyone is trying, all these companies are trying where they should be on that line, where they should be on the line, which product they should go on online, which product they should go offline, which, which types of customers they should go. Maybe older customers will be more offline, younger customers more online, this, uh, grocery more offline, electronics more online. Uh, in certain parts of the country, um, if, it is, uh, if it is uh, big cities where there is very dense population, where you can get this last mile delivery uh, benefits, you can go online. If it is villages, you might go offline, or, not villages, if, if it is a suburban areas, you can go offline because otherwise the logistics cost might be extremely high. So, so everyone is trying, what everyone is trying to do, all these retailers is trying to find out what is the sweet spot? What is the optimal spot in terms of this line of omnichannel, where at one end is online and one end is offline. Nobody is anymore pure online or pure offline. Everyone is omnichannel. The question is, what proportion? Uh, today, Amazon is, let's say, 30, uh, 20, 30% offline, 70% online. Whereas uh, Walmart is opposite, 20, 30% online, 70% offline. But everyone is trying to uh, manipulate these things. So we are almost at the end. Uh, so the thing is that, again, the whole idea is to 
uh, and we will uh, I, I will bring in back some of the things again if you have time to read this case uh, uh, we have another one week to read this case because next class when I am even discussing about how to teach a case I will start referring to this case again and again that how, how you should re uh, uh, teach the case and I in the meantime I will share with uh, Numan two of my uh, uh, two different courses that I teach I will share with him my course outline to show when I am discussing I like one course is a more strategy course where I do a much more case and another is a more technical course where I do much less case. So I wanted to show you how to select what type of case, where do I do the case, what type of case I want to select. Uh, I will share my course outline for uh, two different types of courses so that you have something rather than just talking, I want to share what I at least do. Again, as I said at the beginning, it's not that I have all the answers. I, I can tell you what are my experiences uh, and what works for me, what doesn't work for me, uh, what are the some of the problems, and I will go much more details into those things. Um, so next class, uh, next, uh, next Thursday when we discuss, we will uh, discuss mostly about the teaching methodology uh, in, the, uh, in the things, what should you take, and take a, but when I'm teaching methodology, I might again go back and talk about some of this, uh, uh, the relation with the case. Uh, 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 yeah, absolutely, Norman, please go ahead and ask uh, 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 yeah. the one word about the case. Yeah, thank you, uh, Saibal. So yeah. I was uh, proposing to Saibal that everyone is writing one word that you learn from the case study. Jadi tulis yeah. di chat satu kata yang Bapak Ibu anggap sebagai kata kunci dalam case ini. Silakan. Sebelum menulis tidak boleh leave. You cannot leave before you write. Yeah. <laughs> you write one word. Uh, Saibal, we start as, as uh, one, one hour earlier next week or same time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Next week is okay. Yeah, next week is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight, my, eight, my 8 p.m. is okay. Today I had something, but... And next week is All right. okay. So yeah. next week we will start at seven, seven o'clock morning here. Yeah. Uh, and eight o'clock in your time PM. Uh, there was another question about this teaching note. Uh, again, I will discuss about the teaching note, whether it is useful or not. Okay. Uh, 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 next class also. Um, I, and Noman, I will, I, I will touch base with you uh, tomorrow or day after, and I will yes. share with you some class notes, a uh, yes. course outline, okay? Okay. Thank you, okay. Saibal. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank, it, you, Thank you very much. You can, so Thank you. Can, you, can, yes, you can leave for us. So, <laughs> yeah. but everybody is still writing, so I, I will copy that one. <laughs> okay. One word. Okay, satu kata. Jangan panjang-panjang. <laughs> Udah kadung panjang, gimana? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bagus, Pak Nyaman. Ya, terima kasih Pak Mesdin. Terima uh, kasih. Sorry uh, saya on off. Enggak apa-apa. Jadi dulu. tidak kita kita melihat dia ngajar kita seperti apa itu bisa kita contoh nanti. Iya. Nah, jadi Kalau minggu boleh. depan mudah-mudahan lebih banyak yang ngomong. Saya sengaja enggak banyak tadi saya berikan kesempatan kepada Bapak Ibu. Jadi tolong lebih banyak yang <laughs> Kalau boleh usul, yang, Pak. Yang Pak fighting Pak. katanya, harus fight. Ya, Nanti harus berani berbeda pandangan. Yang hasil recordnya juga di share ke kita kita ya, Pak Nyaman. Kenapa, Pak? Hasil recordnya nanti juga kita di share. Ya, ya. boleh, boleh nanti kita ini. Kan. Ya, ya, dibagi ya, Pak. Pak Nyaman Baik. ya. Wah, ini menarik sekali ini kata-katanya menarik ini. Ada yang fresh strategy transformation excellent, apalagi ini better preparation, uh, adaptation, new shaping, knowledgeable. Developing business, technology company versus logistic company, platform. Wah, Pak Marno yang ajar retail. Nah iya, kata-kata platform. Platform, wah itu penting sekali kata-katanya. Sekarang itu. Tapi kita karena udah terbiasa dengan Gojek bisa cepat nangkep ya. Betul. Menarik memang ini, sudi kasih. Ya. Baik. Baik, Bapak Ibu, terima kasih. Silakan. Terima kasih, Pak Nyoman. 
Ya, terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Oh, Bapak Ibu yang ya, lain. Terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Jangan lupa ya. minggu depan kita ketemu lagi. Ya. Terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Terima kasih Nyoman. Terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Udah nulis udah boleh live. Ini kopi kan nanti saya forward nanti semua ini dulu. Ya maaf tak tinggal-tinggal juga tadi. Terima kasih Pak ya. Silakan silakan. Silakan live ya. Ya terima kasih Pak Nyoman. Makasih, Bisa diberikan Ma. summary-nya ya, tulisan tangannya tadi. Ah, nanti kita summary sama-sama di grup. Oke, okay. oke, okay, good. Makasih, Pak. Ya, makasih, makasih. Terima kasih, Pak Nyaman. Makasih, Pak. Ya, Pak Ya. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> see you later. Oke, okay, see you. <laughs>